So, and to our audience, if you have questions, if you will send them in to that bottom left-hand corner question area, we will try to get those to our panelists as we go. Several have come along during the course of these lectures. And can we get our panelists up? We'll start with Dr. Moore, who's just come aboard. Um, Dr. Moore, do you evacuate the blood when you put the packing in there? And ha tell us really how you put that packing in the pelvis. But Test generally, yeah. yeah, we hear you. We hear you. Go ahead. The uh, the blood is generally forced out as you uh, introduce the pack, so there's no effort to evacuate the blood. Uh, in fact, right. it's uh, you rather. You just have to clean the light fixtures, do. right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's Venus, however. Uh, <laughs> it's Venus. He says so it's we Venus. make no effort to uh, evacuate the blood. We simply place the packs. Because someone was asking about. Well, tell me, tell me where to put them. What you're using laparotomy pads, and tell me just physically how you move the bladder <laughs> side to side and how you put it in there. Because I think this is a technique that, especially in areas that do not have access to angiography, and and probably in the states where we do have access to angiography, I think we're grossly underutilizing this technique based on your data. Well, the uh, the technique is pretty simple in the sense that. Uh, you open the uh, hematoma generally when you make that midline incision, the underlying tissue is so fragile that that hematoma ruptures spontaneously. And we generally start on what we believe is the offending side, that is with the most severe pelvic fracture, and then use a uh, retractor such as a Deaver, okay. sweetheart, to pull the bladder to the opposite side. And then the key a point we've learned from our orthopedic surgeons is that first pack has to be driven uh, as far back as possible. Yeah. And then you just add packs on top of that to, uh, before, you know, provide the tampon on on that side and then do the same on the opposite side. Great. So, so do, you see, do you see an immediate response? Do you, does your bleeding stop in front of you? Yes. Yes, it does. It's remarkable. So Usually that... Uh, this, by the time you put the second sponge in, uh, it is not uh, colored with blood. So it, it's reassuring when you see that. So do you close that then and go above it to do a laparotomy for other injuries? Or do you just continue? How do you stay retroperitoneal and intraperitoneal if the patient needs an intraperitoneal operation? Right. So we, uh, we close the midline fascia with uh, heavy suture to uh, assure that tampon out of the pelvis. And if a laparotomy is required, then we make that cephalad and, and intentionally keep it separate from the uh, suprapubic incision. And do you try to grab the peritoneum as you close that retroperitoneum, or is it all above you? So the retroperitoneum all, lines all above you, right? Exactly. The yeah. peritoneum is not violated, so yeah. it's uh, all cephalad to that. That's great. Uh, let's comp since uh, actually we lost Dr. Leclerc. Are you still there, Dr. Leclerc? Oh, yes, I am. All right, we're going to jump around here. We have a question about how you handle renovascular pseudoaneurysms. It says, the adult sure. literature quotes very high mortality and suggests embolization to prevent catastrophic bleeding. We've non-operatively watched, uh, watched three recently, all resolved. What are your thoughts on that? Um, very recently, we had a case that, uh, w in, in which we performed embolization. Um, it's becoming quite common now with, that we perform embolization in, in this pseudoaneurysm, either in the kidney, but also in the spleen or in the liver. That happened quite a couple of times uh, uh, in the recent time. Yeah, I think it worked. We didn't have uh, um, this very high mortality that, that has been quoted. I know this paper in the, in the literature. I, I don't know if others have another experience, but we've done that at least once in a kidney and it did work. So what's the secret to making that work? I don't know, it's the, the angiographists that do it. <laughs> <laughs> the radiologist, not the surgeon. That, that probably makes the big difference. Yeah. Well, we'll have one here next time. Uh, Dr. Petty, there was a question about the use of VAC on neonates, uh, specifically in myelomeningocele. Do you know anything about that? Uh, you know, if you can use it on the brain, you probably can use it on a neural tube defect, but I'm not a neurosurgeon or the son of a neurosurgeon, so I'd probably defer to them. But, um, but they face a lot of the same problems, you know, some version of a neural defect, and how are you going to cover that? So, uh, so I would say a guarded yes to that, but I would, I would put you in touch with a couple of the 
Peace neurosurgery folks here if you wanted to talk some more about that. But but I wouldn't disqualify that given a lot of the other things that have been done with it. And Dr. Petty, did you uh, did you happen to notice those polls we put up there about the VAC dressing? Um, I didn't. What, what so was the, uh, well, first the first thing we asked was the, about the audience about who's used it, and it was uh, sounds like most people used it, but there was a significant number about twenty five percent that had not used it, and most of them said they do want to now after hearing your talk. But then the next question that we asked was, what have people found to be the most common complication? And without, without even a close second, it was fistulas. Uh, what experience have you had? I know I've had experience with uh, enterocutaneous, actually enterovac fistulas. Uh, enteroatmospheric. Uh, yeah, enteroatmospheric fistulas uh, using the vac on a, on, a, on a newborn. Have you had trouble with that, even using the white sponge? You know, uh, thankfully, no, and I, I think, uh, but it'll happen to me eventually. So I, I think, you know, the goal is to get the abdomen closed as quickly as possible. And so it probably goes without saying that there there is a price to pay by leaving an abdomen open. I mean, there's plenty of good reasons to do it, but I think it's all risks and benefits, and those things have to be weighed against each other. I think, you know, most fistulas uh, often can close on their own, and I think the white sponge, if nothing else, is a very tidy way to manage that situation. Um, but uh, but it's a problem, and I think it's a function not just of the vac, but of the of the open abdomen. I think in certain situations, you know, the thought would be is the vac actually sucking the stuff out, and and I'm not sure that that's entirely a plausible mechanism uh, for that. I think having the abdomen open and having bowel at risk is true, whether you're using a vac or or not. So I, I think the principles of trying to get as much closed as quickly as is safe for the patient is probably a good rule of thumb. But like they used in that. Uh, brain back paper. They were afraid they were going to get these high output CSF fistulas, and that wasn't really borne out. So, so I don't, I don't think the vac entirely works by you know finding the lumen and sucking out you know the stuff that you fear to come out. But uh, an open abdomen or or any other situation like that certainly has a risk. All right, thank you. And uh, um, Dr. Sheridan, you there? Yes, I am. So there was a question from Dr. Minifee about alkalinizing alkal the urine for myoglobinuria. Uh, do you do that? Have you do ever do it prophylactically? Do you do that routinely uh, when they have myoglobinuria? How do you do that? I, I don't do it routinely, but I have to say I have done it on many occasions just by putting an amp of bicarb in a liter of fluid, and that slightly hypertonic fluid is actually not a bad way to, not a bad adjunct for resuscitation either. Okay. Uh, I think that's, we answered most of the questions. If someone has other questions, please send them in. I know we have a case. There, there, was, a, there was a VAC question uh, the, the, about the, how do you manage the edges of the plastic sheet? Yeah. Do you sew them to the wound or do you tuck them under widely? Would you address that, anyone? Yeah, I, I think if you tuck it under the fascia all the way to the gutter, it allows the, the flaps to move relative to the viscera and, and just, Anecdotally, I think that helps you get it closed better as opposed to if, two, if those two things are stuck to each other, you know, each holding the other in place. Dr. LeClaire, do you use the VAC? Yes, we do, and mostly uh, for, for complications, especially in neonate. I saw just a question uh, in, on the chat. Uh, we, we tend to use it in neonates in whom we have difficulties in closing the wound uh, for any reason. So, yeah, we do. What kind of pressure do you use? Do you reduce the pressure to 75, like Dr. Petty was saying? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I have a, I have a response here from Dr. Rosen. Uh, it has to do with the uh, embolization. He says, the problem we had with embolization, see if I lost it here. Is that they are yeah, they concerned to be able to super select the, 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 the good branch of the artery, that's it? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, I was reading this, this remark. It's, it's true. It's a concern they sometimes have. But my position on this is uh, if we go in as a surgeon, we won't be able to do it any better. Uh, so it's always good to give it a try with the embolization because if you need to try to do some sort of partial nephrectomy in this context, it almost all the time ends up being a total nephrectomy. I think it's always good to give it a try if the patient is stable enough um, to have this, this, this time spent for embolization. If it, if it doesn't work, then it, it will end up being the same, being a nephrectomy either by embolization or by surgery. Dr. Moore, do you have any tricks about using the VAC? 
Well, no more than uh, has already been uh, outlined uh, nicely by uh, John. I think the only uh, difference that we uh, apply in adults is that we place sutures in the uh, midline fascia uh, to maintain tension. Uh, we put the white sponge on the uh, gut and uh, place uh, large number two nylons uh, about five centimeters apart uh, the entire distance of the wound. And the other lesson we learned is uh, we go back to the operating room religiously every 48 hours to change that out. And then as he's that described nicely, we begin at one end and proceed and close it uh, to the midline. And uh, Wayne, as you know, we've reported uh, recently that we've had 100% closure rate with damage control and trauma, unless there's been abdominal wall uh, a loss from a shotgun wound. We've been able to close 100% of these patients. This conference appears to be inactive and will be ended soon. If you are the host and wish this conference to continue, please press yeah. any key hey, Gene, on hold on there. telephone touchpad. <laughs> sure. Sorry, continue. <clears throat> so we're very uh, uh, enthused about the wound vac, and I mean, in general, uh, it's been uh, godsend to manage all these complex wounds, but. Certainly with the open abdomen, it has uh, been a sea change. Uh, we've had terrible problems 10 years ago with with uh, component separation and various mesh reconstructions, and we've largely eliminated that by the uh, continuous pressure on the fascia and the wound vac. And we've had a lot fewer fistulae to deal with in these open abdomens in the post-vac era than in the pre-vac era, in my experience, not the other way around. A question for Dr. Petty with the VAC. I think one problem I've noticed is that uh, doctors like to use them for every wound and not really pay a lot of attention to the wounds. And I think, if, I wonder if that's been your experience, and I don't think a, a VAC is a replacement for good surgical care. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, especially on that infection question, I think you still need to be looking at the wound on a regular basis if, if that's the question. I, I think it's nice when it's there and it's tempting to leave it alone, but but I think until your wound is stabilized, you're really obliged, not because you're going to do anything different with your dressing, but because you need to assess what's going on with the wound. Just one real quick uh, comment to follow up on what Dr. Moore said. I, I think there's uh, at least one randomized study in adults looking at retention sutures plus the vac, and, th and those wounds, uh, those abdomens were actually closed uh, more successfully. So there may be a role for additional things besides just the vac, as you've already touched on. Dr. Moore, uh, Dr. Sharma wants to know about the long-term outcome following bilateral internal iliac artery ligation and embolization for pelvic fractures in children. Well, I don't have any uh, data to report on. Uh, we've seen adults with uh, bilateral embolizations that have had uh, perineal uh, sloughing uh, and all kinds of disastrous uh, Complications. So, at least in the adults, uh, we try to target uh, one of those systems or the other and allow collateralization. Uh, we're loath to uh, take out both uh, internal systems. Yeah. We have a question here uh, from uh, Dr. Sedillo uh, that there may be some report from the combat ready, ready clamp in pelvic uh, trauma in children. Does anybody know anything about that? I've never heard of it. So, how about uh, Dr. Sheridan? Do you know anything about that? I mean, I've not seen it, but I've heard of it. It's uh, basically an external clamp, like a C clamp, that would go down in the groin to get those, you know, very high groin shots and press on them proximally. Um, I have minimal experience with long-term follow-up, but I have seen some, you know, uh, iliac ligations that certainly were associated with a lot of necrotic muscle on the inside. And so that clamp would be a great idea if it works. Got a case. And actually, yeah, 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 case. If you wouldn't mind staying with us here for a few more minutes, uh, Dr. John Crow, who is the uh, surgeon in chief at the Akron Children's Hospital and also the director of the trauma service, has a case he'd like to present to you uh, for a little discussion. And we look for your perspective, Dr. Crow. Well, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, um, let's see if we can get this We're case get up. Slides up. Yep. This is a little girl that came in uh, to us last uh, Memorial Day, so it's, we're, we're approaching about 10 months after the injury. John, before, while we're waiting for the slides, about how many traumas do you see a year? 
Uh, we, we have over a thousand traumas in our registry. We get about four to 500 trauma alerts, uh, of which about you know, 50, 75 to 100 are the more severe injuries like this patient. Okay. Um, so, next slide, or can I advance it? Yeah, the bottom, oh, I can, yeah, do you have the? We'll let, them, let them focus on that. Okay, there we go, yeah. So this was an eight-year-old girl. She was playing in, the, in our patio in the back of her house, and her uh, father was showing a neighbor how to use a, run a tow motor, which is like a forklift truck. Uh, the, uh, these are controlled by handles, and the, uh, it went out of control. It, it broke through a fence, and it went, rolled right over her uh, pelvic region. She was taken to the local hospital by EMS in a short period of time. She was awake and alert, but presented there in shock with uh, the following uh, injuries. She obviously had an open pelvic fracture, and she had a traumatic evisceration of the abdomen. She had an uh, open femur fracture on the left, which uh, was the side that the uh, tow motor uh, came up onto her, and she also had a fracture on the right. She had extensive soft tissue injury to the left buttock in continuity with per almost the entire soft tissue of the left thigh. She, her vaginal and urethral openings were not evident. She did have strong distal uh, extremity pu uh, pulses on both sides, but the uh, side that was most badly injured was the left. Next slide. So I have some pictures from uh, her. I, did you go too far? This was her admission picture. And you can see uh, on your left the uh, x-ray showing the open fracture and uh, both femurs that were broken. You can see the extensive uh, contamination and soft tissue injury to the medial aspect of the left leg. Next slide. You can see I put a circle around the area of traumatic evisceration and that was all in continuity with the open uh, fracture the anterior portion of the pelvis. Next slide, please. And then this is what, uh, this was actually a shot the next morning, but this was what uh, her buttock as well as her inner thigh, as you saw, looked like uh, at the time of injury and in a short period of time. I think that's the last. Okay. Dr. Why don't you go back, Dr. back one. Dr. Uh, Petty? Can we, um, I'm sorry, can we ask the faculty to please turn their cameras back on? We didn't mean to close those, sorry. Please go ahead and turn on your cameras so we can join in the discussion here. So, Dr. Petty. Dr. Petty, what would your, yeah. what do you think? What would be your initial approach to this? Assuming the airway's okay and her breathing's okay. Yeah, well, I, I think you got to do all the trauma-based stuff, and if you can get to the operating room, uh, it's a complicated problem. Obviously, I, I think you've got to reestablish your abdominal cavity and separate that from the pelvis. So, uh, I think probably a laparotomy and putting something down there to keep the bowel uh, where it belongs, and then stabilizing the pelvis, obviously, to keep her from hemorrhaging. Those would be two good good places to start with something like that. And then you can, you know, kind of pick up the pieces a little bit. But from a damage control perspective, uh, I think that's probably a good way to go. Dr. Moore, what would you what would you add to this? Back a slide. Yeah. Yeah. Can you go back a slide? Well, I, uh, I'm not sure I'd have anything substantive to add. Uh, I think uh, the foremost uh, focus would be on uh, resuscitation uh, in the operating room and then uh, engaging uh, the appropriate disciplines to uh, begin the damage control and plan her operative course uh, accordingly. Is she so a, I think, uh, did, did she get a CTA? Is there no vascular injury? Uh, she went right up to surgery from the treatment room. She was uh, still in shock when she arrived. Dr. Moore, is there, is there an indication here for Preperitoneal packing? Well, that would depend on the uh, hemodynamic response and uh, the ongoing bleeding at the time of uh, the operating room evaluation. I, I don't, at this point, I don't see any immediate indication for packing. And Dr. LeClaire, what about the urologic part of it? What would you recommend? Uh, certainly, I would go for a suprapubic vesicostomy and probably would think about uh, some sort of diverting colostomy because I would be very concerned of how the perineum will heal without having a colostomy prior to that. And what about you, uh, Dr. Sheridan? What's your, what is your thought about the crush component I, of this? I'd be, I'd be worried about the, the muscle in that buttock and thigh that you, that's not obvious. Oh, I, I probably would explore that just to make sure 
that there's not a lot of devitalized muscle back there that's going to get you in trouble later. And I would just make sure. She, I assume she's got good distal pulses, and and you're not worried about a, a you know an iliac injury or anything like that. Yeah, that's, I would that's certainly correct. explore that big that area. Yeah, but how would you explore that area? Are you going to make an incision in it? Um, if I couldn't get, if you know, it looks like she's been degloved, and she, you may be able to get it from the front. But if not, I would have no trouble making an additional incision in the back to look. So okay. What did you do? It looks like she's torn her superior gluteal artery off her internal iliac, and it's bleeding into her underneath her gluteus muscle, and that's going to make that whole muscle compartment a compartment syndrome. It'll die and make her sick as hell. Okay. That's yeah, what it looks really like well. to me. All right, let's go on. Well, this was about the second week, I think, Dr. Ponsky was at our hospital, so he came in and was my, uh, yeah, was my, my helper. That's, yeah, you probably <laughs> can actually see him. Uh, next slide. So what we found at surgery actually was there was no solid organ injury and there was no great vessel injury. Uh, the pelvis was essentially wide open. It was not actively bleeding. Uh, we did find, though, that the, uh, the bladder and the vagina were completely avulsed and were, were free-floating in the pelvis. Um, we uh, uh, basically put a suprapubic tube in so we could monitor urine output, and we uh, were getting into the triad of death, so we rapidly closed the abdomen and uh, took her over to the ICU. Next slide. So then in the first six hours, we, uh, we faced uh, uh, fairly severe hemorrhage. We wrapped her pelvis in a, uh, we had a, 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 a bed sheet around her pelvis, which we tightened. Uh, we could monitor the urine out, or the bleeding pretty much through the pelvis. The portion you saw uh, where the bowel was coming out was still open. Um, we had to get her warm, and then uh, we got to the point where we had everything corrected. We gave factor seven. And at about five hours post-injury, she had stopped bleeding and was, uh, was stable. Dr. Moore, what do you think about this now? Do you think she might have benefited from a, a preemptive packing of the pelvis? Well, I think, again, that's uh, clinical judgment. Uh, she's obviously required a lot of products, but we don't know how much uh, when that was lost uh, in the pre-hospital phase or early phase. Uh, we would... Uh, I think in the operating room, try to calibrate the ongoing blood loss and then perform a thromboelastogram. And there are features on that that would move us to being more aggressive with uh, tampon off. Specifically, uh, if she had evidence of fibrinolysis and uh, very deranged uh, markers in all the different areas, we'd be more likely to pack preemptively, assuming that we're going to deal with a coagulopathy. So as I closed her abdomen, I didn't really see any blood coming up out of the pelvis. It mostly was running um, out of the lower wound in the inner, inner thigh. Would you have put left packings in at that first operation, Dr. Moore? Well, this is a very complex injury, and I applaud you for uh, your care. Uh, I think just like any open pelvic fracture, we would... Uh, pack it externally as well and so I think I would put uh, gauze along that uh, that sort of a morale lesion you, you were uh, confronted with. Okay. Dr. Uh, Sheridan, do you have anything to say about the resuscitation fluid wise here? No, I mean, uh, so you warmed her up and you, did you, she never went to angio. That's correct. Uh, we, we, we were getting the angio people mobilized when we were giving the factor seven we were really doing okay at that point, and it seemed like something with everything we did, between being warm and everything, the bleeding stopped and she became stable. I think the accident occurred around 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night, and this was 1 or 2 in the morning, and she really kind of uh, uh, calmed down then. I could monitor the bleeding, and it had, it had dried up. And the yeah, abdomen. I certainly agree with Dr. Moore. I mean, you don't know wh what went to what. You just have to, or what, when, th when she lost what, you just respond to her physiology, and know, stay heavy with the colloid. Dr. LeClaire, in your experience, do you have a lot of bleeding in the pelvis when you have an avulsion of the vagina and the urethra? Uh, I have to admit, we've never seen an avulsion of the vagina, but yeah, I guess this is a region that is very, very vascularized. Uh, we know that in, in reconstructive surgery, so I guess it might be uh, uh, um, some indication for angiography for maybe embolization again, because it might be bleeding here, of course. Because that could be a signal that you probably want to do a preventive, pre preemptive packing uh, yeah. of this patient because you're going to yeah. probably go back in two or a couple of days anyway. 
So exactly. at least you're put, leaving something in to try to stem the, the bleeding part of this. It goes back to the coagulopathy uh, that we're all trying to address. Next slide. So uh, the first, at the first operation, we had our attending urologist as well as our orthopedic surgeon there. And then they joined us again uh, the next morning, which was a Saturday morning. And what we did at that point was uh, take that, take, oh, reopen the abdomen, do a diverting colostomy. You can see the uh, laparotomy pad still in the hole, which was where we had most of the bleeding. Um, we also brought the uh, uh, bladder back down and reconstructed the uh, urethra over the foley that you see in the left-hand picture, and we uh, reconstructed the vagina. We also took off all of the discolored uh, skin and fat down to muscle. The muscle, in fact, was all uh, healthy. This was all just a, a degloving, as what Dr. Sheridan had mentioned. Dr. Petty, what do you think about the fact that the, he didn't do a, a colostomy on the first shot, the first procedure? Well, I, I think it's damage control mode, and, uh, you know, I think to go back in a couple of days and do something more uh, definitive when you can get a better look at the injuries and stuff is perfectly fine. Dr. LeClaire? Uh, we certainly have done a colostomy, uh, seeing the, the, the injury in the perineum, because it's very simple to do, and if you don't do it, the complications might be dramatic. So I would have not hesitated, I think. Uh, and you can, you can actually see that the injury goes up to the anal, to the okay. anal uh, mucosa uh, on the right-hand picture there. That, we debrided her all the way to the uh, perianal area. Dr. Moore, would you have waited? Well, uh, with this injury, I, I think uh, what I've been tempted to do is just uh, fire a staple across the uh, rectosigmoid junction and then the next day do the colostomy. I don't think I would spend the time uh, at the initial uh, operation to do that, but I think a staple line would uh, take care of that problem. Uh, of course, we've had uh, patients with damage control surgery. We've had the colon stable for five days uh, without any problems, so I don't think a stapling for 24 hours is a problem. Would you do a sigmoidoscopy at this time to clean out the distal in? Well, I would. That's controversial, but I would if, uh, again, uh, depending upon the uh, hemodynamic status of the patient, if uh, it allows, I would try to get that stool out of there. I you, certainly want to see if there's rectal tears and so on that would potentially contaminate the space because I think really uh, uh, pelvic sepsis would be a disaster in this poor girl. So it's really what we're talking about here is timing. I don't think there's a disagreement as to whether they need diversion. It's a matter of when to do it. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And in fact, we did look up her... Uh, we did a proctoscopy and her injury was all superficial. There was no evidence for rectal injury. And Dr. Suhail, who is in uh, Tunisia, just, uh, just uh, said that he would uh, also do a colostomy on the first, uh, first pass. But I think the staple, the staple uh, technique is a great technique because it cuts down the amount of time you're in the operating room. This child is obviously going to get cold, uh, is going to have problems with coagulopathy. Uh, so it's almost like you don't want to do everything at the first shot. You just do what you got to do and then move out. Dr. LeClaire, any other thoughts about that? Yeah, it's fine, it's fine for me, but I mean, the main goal for colostomy is not, uh, the main goal is not to, to, to explore any rectal injuries. It's just that we know that this perineum, it will take time for, for it to heal, and, and sepsis in this would be dramatic. So it's not a matter of, of exploring some, some rectal perforation, it's just I would be really scared of having this perineum not diverted from stools. Oh, I can probably do it. Okay. Next slide. Next slide, please. So the so about 12 hours post-op or post-injury, we did the second operation was the next day was uh, to uh, do the bladder and vaginal repair um, and and bring her urinary uh, system and her vagina back together. Uh, orthopedics came and fixed her femurs, and then we excised all of that soft tissue. Uh, then we started with daily dressing changes, uh, which you can see uh, the third line shows the days that we did intraoperative or uh, under anesthesia dressing changes. On the fifth day, she had a, uh, a, a uh, external fixation, which I'll show you a picture of next. We then switched her to, to VAC. We had actually the uh, drug or the rep from the company for the VAC come in, it took about an hour and a half, but we were able to really stabilize the wounds using the VAC. 
And what I noticed, every time I went uh, on a daily dressing change is I had to excise quite a bit more of the tissue because it seemed to desiccate even though we were doing wet to dries. So by doing the vax, we really stabilized the wound, eventually did a skin graft, and then she did have a subsequent laparotomy for a bowel obstruction uh, on post-op day 30 from some of the small bowels sticking down into the pelvis. Uh, there, there is a, can I? Go ahead, please. Uh, there's a question here for the panel uh, from one of our friends, I think is in uh, Egypt. Uh, they're asking whether there's any place to monitor intra-abdominal pressure in this case. Dr. Moore? Well, there certainly is with the uh, requirements for the passive blood uh, resuscitation. There would be. Uh, the problem, of course, how, was you, how are you going to monitor it uh, with uh, the abdomen? I... Uh, again, it's uh, clinical judgment. Uh, most of the time when we do a laparotomy under these conditions, uh, we leave the fascia open until we go back the next day uh, because we're concerned about uh, a secondary abdominal compartment syndrome uh, evolving as uh, resuscitation is uh, completed. Uh, short of that, though, I, I think then in these kind of patients, we have to look for other uh, indications of uh, abdominal compartment uh, syndrome, and in particular, PK airway pressures and, of course, uh, urinary output and so on. So I think it is a concern. Uh, how do you monitor it? I think it uh, depends on uh, your resources, but I agree that it's a, it's a potential concern in somebody like this. Do the case. Dr. Pe uh, by the way, uh, Sion Hospital is in the Swiss Alps, so I apologize uh, for putting in Egypt. Um, <laughs> Dr. Petty, do you have any thoughts about uh, intra-abdominal monitoring with the uh, VAC in place? Well, I think you can get recurrent intra-abdominal hypertension even with a VAC, so it, it's not bulletproof in that sense. And I think a lot of things Dr. Moore said, I mean, an abdominal exam, you can measure bladder pressures and see where that puts you, but I think if you get into that situation, the solution is to go back, to take the VAC down, to spread things out more widely and uh, come back and fight again another day. So it can certainly happen, uh, but I don't think um, it's driven by anything other than your clinical suspicion. To have the syndrome, you have to have other things besides the pressure. Uh, so if you're developing the syndrome and your abdominal exam is getting firmer, you can measure bladder pressures and that sort of thing too. Uh, but it's, it's not common, but it can happen. Dr. LeClaire, is it, uh, you think an injured bladder is a good place to check intra-abdominal pressure in this situation? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I would more rely on, on the clinical signs like diuresis and, and the, the clinical examination. I don't know how uh, a ruptured bladder, uh, especially if it's ruptured intraperitoneally, how it does response in terms of compliance um, to the intraabdominal pressure. So I would not rely. No, you're right. Okay. Dr. Sheridan? You know, I, I would uh, agree with all of the above, uh, especially the sequence of diversion. But the one thing I'd pick up on is the uh, these degloving uh, sort of torque rotation injuries, They're, they hide debris, they hide dead muscle, and there's a lot of progressive uh, necrosis of damaged muscle and progressive microvascular thrombosis as sort of the coagulation cascade improves. And, and I think you were very smart to take this kid back frequently and really look and uh, debride uh, sort of aggressively sequentially because you can get in terrible trouble with this uh, this kind of large muscle mass torque injury. Okay, Dr. Next, Curl. next slide. So this is what she looked like. Can someone go on? I can't go on. Next slide. It's coming. It's taking Okay. Oh, that's not so here's, uh, here's the inner part of the thigh wound. You can see it's starting to granulate, and there's the external fixator as well as the x-ray showing uh, the internal repairs that were done by our uh, specialists in pelvic uh, uh, pelvic fractures and trauma. Next slide. So this is where the vac really helped. Uh, you can see this is actually the gluteus muscle and the and the muscles of the posterior and lateral compartments of the thigh. The uh, skin and the fat was all dead. We took that off. Um, I was able actually through that ridge you see on the left picture to go right up to the sacrum. And, could, and, could, and visualize the sciatic nerve at that level. And here was the vac that was in place uh, in continuity with the posterior thigh. Next slide. And then we grafted it on post-op day 20, put the vac back on it, 
left it on uh, for about four days. We have a very busy adult and pediatric burn center here, so we cared for her wounds in the uh, later phases in the burn center. Next slide. Um, I took her to surgery recently to check her anus uh, to be sure that she had a, uh, a functional anus, which she does. Her injury to the anus itself appeared relatively minor. Um, the lower picture shows an intact vagina. In fact, her hymen is still intact, and I could not see any evidence that we had had anastomosed the vagina back together. Uh, the skin grafts there, although not uh, pretty compared to what we were with, I was quite satisfied uh, with it. Um, next slide. She's a, a very active girl, and, I, and she's able, she's gotten rid of her first her walker and now her cane. Um, she still does have a foot drop on the, uh, on the left side, which I suspect is related to peripheral nerve injury at the sacral plexus or maybe at the sciatic. Um, she does still have uh, a, a denervated bladder. Let me just stop there. No, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Next slide. So we looked at our pelvic fractures. This was three years worth at our trauma center. We had almost, uh, we had 59 children starting at age three. There was a progressive increase in incidence as we got into the teenage years, and that's no surprise. The mechanism was most commonly in our population, motor vehicular collision, particularly in the teenager. Uh, ATVs as young as uh, three to the, we had one in the three to five year old age group. Uh, we do get the typical sporting and then pedestrians versus car. We had one death, which was from uh, uh, was a minor pelvic fracture, not a not a, comp a disruption of the ring, from a tr uh, head trauma. We had one associated spinal cord injury, and we had uh, five patients who went to rehab, and the rest went home. A third of them had a ISS over uh, 15 or higher. Next slide. Uh, the uh, literature for pediatric pelvic fractures is a little bit old. Are you advancing? I'm trying. It's not. Okay. Probably skip it if you can't get it. That was the last slide. Oh, okay. Uh, must not have come through. That's that's probably enough. The literature in children. There was a, an old study comparing adults and children who really had uh, a little different mechanism, but were otherwise handled the same. Uh, none of the children in a large series out of Sandy, uh, out of California, showed uh, evidence of pelvic exsanguination. And as Dr. Moore has shown, he did not have that in Denver as well. Dr. LeClaire, what do you think about the uh, uh, neurologic problems she may have with her bladder? Not sure. I don't know. Maybe um, some injury to the nerves due to deceleration or something due to a sacral problem. I, I really don't know. I, I don't clearly understand the mechanism, and probably that's a good reason to still hope and think maybe things could improve. Does she have a super pubic catheter still in place? No, no. She, uh, um, she's not currently not straight cathing, but she does leak. Um, I think that's probably, other than the uh, disability okay. on her foot and lower right. leg, going to be uh, a long-term issue. Uh, obviously, the urologists were involved from the beginning and put her bladder back together, and they're in a wait-and-see attitude like you, you just mentioned. Because you had mentioned uh, something like a denervated bladder, which I don't really understand. And I'm sure it's not the, the suprapubic diversion. Even if it's for a long period of time, that would be responsible for that. If a bladder is normal, you can divert it and it restarts to work. But maybe it's, maybe it's more problem of, a, of a sphincteric incontinence. I don't know. That's a good point. That's a very good point. I wonder if we could, uh, this is a great case, I wonder if we could just summarize each of you, starting with uh, Dr. Sheridan, uh, your general uh, perspective on this uh, session and any specific thing that you think is extremely important for the people who are listening uh, to have gotten out of this session. Just your point of view. Dr. Well, Sheridan? I, well, I mean, I like the, uh, the trauma bay approach, uh, the quick laparotomy to, is, you know, put a a GIA across the colon at the first step, put a vac on, and then, you know, resuscitate, warm up, and come back. I like the uh, colloid heavy resuscitation, and um, I'm impressed that you got away without taking her to angio, uh, but that, was, that worked. Uh, I was uh, impressed with the quick, you know, fixation of the fractures and that you didn't get into trouble with the soft tissue wounds in that buttock and in the thigh where there, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there was a lot of uh, hidden debris and dead muscle over time. And as regards to the foot drop, you know, occasionally you'll see somebody, at least in the burn unit, with a big resuscitation who gets, uh, a, you know, a, a tight compartment in the leg. And I've seen some foot drops from, you know, missing compartment uh, syndromes in 
relatively undirectly injured legs, or, uh, but that certainly is uh, a small price to pay if that was involved. So what a great save. Dr. Uh, Petty? Yeah, it's a great case. I think it shows a lot of teamwork and, uh, and forward thinking. Uh, just a couple observations, just looking at that leg wound. I think if you're using the vac on something like that, I, I think it's a good principle not to get too fancy with the arts and crafts project with the sponge because you can lose pieces of it in those folds if you're not real careful. So putting something on top. I think the pelvic packing uh, is a, a great sort of point to uh, bring out in a session like this. I think she had a transperitoneal wound in her pelvis. So I, I think staying extra peritoneal, at least on the side with the bowel coming out, would be a pretty tall order. But I think as a principle for pediatric trauma, it's a great message to get out. I think often, you know, for angio and such, it's not always easy to get vascular access. And so if you're able to put some packings in uh, in the pelvis in a child, uh, it's not always a done deal that it's easy to get them to angio and get that done quickly. So I think that's a really good uh, message to get out to the audience today. Dr. Leclerc from France. Um, uh, obviously, the, the urogenital problem is, is just only one aspect of these sometimes very complex cases. So I would say that it, when the child is stable, when the, the trauma is isolated on the urological point of view, then we, we can aim at an ideal treatment. We have to be idealistic and to be reconstructive. But of course, when the, uro, the urologic problem is only one part of the problem, that just divert, preserve, and then it would be uh, time to reconstruct at some late point. I think one point that uh, Dr. Crow did not make, he was going to make, is the, the mortality rate in the pediatric literature is around 2%. Uh, and Dr. Moore uh, shared with us about a 20% mortality. And since Dr. Moore is going to get the last say here, uh, I wondered if he might address uh, that differential. Yeah, that's, yes, that's a uh, very important point. And we have similarly uh, analyzed our pelvic fractures here and find a similar uh, discordance. Uh, I think uh, much of that is uh, due to mechanism and then secondly to uh, the younger uh, age resilience to our, our uh, lack of attention to shock. But the uh, most common pattern we see with these life-threatening pelvic fractures in adults is autopedestrian. And uh, we probably see one every two weeks. And the car, of course, strikes directly in the pelvis and causes uh, devastating complex pelvic injuries. And I think that's a little different than a child being hit by a car or the other injuries they're involved in. But clearly, as you uh, increase in age, and certainly when you reach the age of 15 to 18, we begin to see patterns that are almost identical to adults. So I think it is age-specific, but that probably relates to a more mechanism than anything else. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. I think you've summarized it extremely well. It's a great case, Dr. Crow. That's a phenomenal teamwork, very impressive. Uh, lucky young lady she had you standing by. Uh, so we look forward to doing this again. Uh, thank you all for your time, your effort, because I know it took time and effort to do this. Uh, I think it was extremely useful. I, I, I got a lot out of it. I learned a, a good bit from each of you. So thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Ponsky, uh, would you like to have the final say? Well, let me thank you. You put uh, this entire show together and uh, countless hours of work uh, that you've spent on this. And thank you very much. The product is here. You can see how how much this has uh, been such a great show. I want to thank all the faculty. John, that case you did was my first day here at Akron Children's, and I thought to myself, what did I just get myself into? Uh, but in my brain, I thought this is not survivable. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just shows you how you can't give up. you got to keep going like a, like a pit bull until you to, and never give up, and that's what happened here. So congratulations on that. Congratulations to everyone joining us here, not only to the faculty, but thank you to all the participants around the world. You can see we have people from every continent. Thank you for joining us. A couple closing uh, items here. If you look at the link there, this actually not only will give you CME credit, but now it will give you the highly sought after maintenance of certification credits, which you now need to maintain your license in the United States if you just take that test. If you don't take the test, you just get your CME credits. If you take the test, you will then have category one um, uh, maintenance of certification. Just to let you know, we have uh, some upcoming shows. We have uh, bowel management with Dr. Bischoff and Dr. Pena coming here next uh, in, a, in a month. And uh, 
We also have uh, a whole slew of shows that we'll be telling you about. We have our update course that's going to be uh, every few months. We'll be updating uh, all the topics in pediatric surgery for uh, maintaining uh, certification. I want to thank everyone again. Uh, have a good day. Have a good night. Have a good afternoon. We'll see you next time. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, thank you. Scott. You're thank welcome. You very much. Bye.